Introduction to the Jumping Frog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain. In English, then in French, then clawed back into a civilised language once more by patient, unremunerated toil. Even a criminal is entitled to fair play, and certainly when a man who has done no harm has been unjustly treated, he is privileged to do his best to right himself. My attention has just been called to an article some three years old, in a French magazine entitled Revue des Deux Mondes, Review of Some Two Worlds, wherein the writer treats of les humoristes américains, these humorists Americans. I am one of these humorists Americans dissected by him, and hence the complaint I am making. This gentleman's article is an able one, as articles go in the French, where they always tangle up everything to that degree that when you start into a sentence you never know whether you are going to come out alive or not. It is a very good article, and the writer says all manner of kind and complimentary things about me, for which I am sure I thank him with all my heart. But then why should he go and spoil all his praise by one unlucky experiment? What I refer to is this. He says my jumping frog is a funny story, but still he can't see why it should ever really convulse anyone with laughter, and straight away proceeds to translate it into French, in order to prove to his nation that there is nothing so very extravagantly funny about it. Just there is where my complaint originates. He has not translated it at all. He has simply mixed it all up. It is no more like the jumping frog when he gets through with it than I am like a meridian of longitude. But my mere assertion is not proof. Wherefore I print the French version that all may see that I do not speak falsely. Furthermore, in order that even the unlettered may know my injury and give me their compassion, I have been at infinite pains and trouble to retranslate this French version back into English, and to tell the truth I have well nigh worn myself out at it, having scarcely rested from my work during five days and nights. I cannot speak the French language, but I can translate very well, though not fast, I being self-educated. I ask the reader to run his eye over the original English version of The Jumping Frog, and then read the French or my retranslation, and kindly take notice how the Frenchman has riddled the grammar. I think it is the worst I ever saw, and yet the French are called a polished nation. If I had a boy that put sentences together as they do, I would polish him to some purpose. Without further introduction, The Jumping Frog, as I originally wrote, was as follows. After it will be found the French version, and after the latter, my retranslation from the French. End of the Introduction to The Jumping Frog Recording by Ruth Golding Frog of Calaveras County. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain. In compliance with the request of a friend of mine who wrote me from the East, I called on good natured, garrulous old Simon Wheeler and inquired after my friend's friend, Leonidas W. Smiley, as requested to do, and I hereunto append the result. I have a lurking suspicion that Leonidas W. Smiley is a myth, 
that my friend never knew such a personage, and that he only conjectured that, if I asked old Wheeler about him, it would remind him of his infamous Jim Smiley, and he would go to work and bore me nearly to death with some infernal reminiscence of him, as long and tedious as it should be useless to me. If that was the design, it certainly succeeded. I found Simon Wheeler dozing comfortably by the barroom stove of the old dilapidated tavern in the ancient mining camp of Angels, and I noticed that he was fat and bald-headed, and had an expression of winning gentleness and simplicity upon his tranquil countenance. He roused up, and gave me good day. I told him a friend of mine had commissioned me to make some inquiries about a cherished companion of his boyhood named Leonidas W. Smiley, Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, a young minister of the gospel, who he had heard was at one time a resident of Angel's Camp. I added that if Mr. Wheeler could tell me anything about this Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, I would feel under many obligations to him. Simon Wheeler backed me into a corner and blockaded me there with his chair, and then sat me down and reeled off the monotonous narrative which follows this paragraph. He never smiled, he never frowned, he never changed his voice from the gentle flowing key to which he tuned the initial sentence, he never betrayed the slightest suspicion of enthusiasm. But all through the interminable narrative there ran a vein of impressive earnestness and sincerity, which showed me plainly that, so far from his imagining that there was anything ridiculous or funny about his story, he regarded it as a really important matter, and admired its two heroes as men of transcendent genius in finesse. To me, the spectacle of a man drifting serenely along through such a queer yarn without ever smiling was exquisitely absurd. As I said before, I asked him to tell me what he knew of Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, and he replied as follows. I let him go on in his own way, and never interrupted him once. There was a fellow here once by the name of Jim Smiley in the winter of forty-nine. Or maybe it was the spring of fifty, I don't recollect exactly, somehow. Though what makes me think it was one or the other is because I remember the big flume wasn't finished when he first came to the camp. But anyway, he was the curiousest man about always betting on anything that turned up you ever see, if he could get anybody to bet on the other side. And if he couldn't, he'd change sides. Any way that suited the other man would suit him. Any way just so as he got a bet, he was satisfied. But still he was lucky, uncommon lucky. He must always come out winner. He was always ready and laying for a chance. There couldn't be no solitary thing mentioned but that fellow had offered a bet on it. And take any side you please, as I was just telling you. If there was a horse race, you'd find him flush, or you'd find him busted at the end of it. If there was a dog fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a cat fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a chicken fight, he'd bet on it. Why, if there was two birds setting on a fence, he would bet you which one would fly first. Or if there was a camp meeting, he would be there regular, to bet on Parson Walker, which he judged to be the best exhorter about here. And so he was, too, and a good man. If he ever seen a straddle-bug start to go anywhere, he would bet you how long it would take him to get wherever he was going to. And if you took him up, he would follow that straddle-bug to Mexico, but what he would find out where he was bound for and how long he was on the road. Lots of the boys here has seen that smiley and can tell you about him. Why, it never made no difference to him. He would bet on anything, the dangdest fella. Parson Walker's wife laid very sick once for a good while, and it seemed as if they weren't going to save her. But one morning he come in, and Smiley asked how she was, and he said she was considerable better, thank the Lord for his infinite mercy, 
and coming on so smart that with the blessing of Providence she'd get well yet. And Smiley, before he thought, says, Well, I'll risk two and a half that she don't anyway. This here Smiley had a mare. The boys called her the fifteen-minute nag, but that was only in fun, you know, because, of course, she was faster than that, and he used to win money on that horse, for all she was so slow and always had the asthma, or the distemper, or the consumption, or something of that kind. They used to give her two or three hundred yards start, and then pass her under way, but always at the fag end of the race she'd get excited and desperate, like and come cavorting and straddling up and scattering her legs around limber, sometimes in the air, and sometimes out to one side amongst the fences, and kicking up more dust, and raising more racket with her coughing and sneezing and blowing her nose, and always fetch up at the stand just about a neck ahead, as near as you could cipher it down. And he had a little small bull pup, that to look at him you'd think he wasn't worth a cent, but to set around and look ornery, and lay for a chance to steal something. But as soon as money was up on him he was a different dog. His underjaw'd begin to stick out like the forecastle of a steamboat, and his teeth would uncover and shine savage like the furnaces. And a dog might tackle him, and bully-rag him, and bite him, and throw him over his shoulder two or three times. And Andrew Jackson, which was the name of the pup, Andrew Jackson would never let on but what he was satisfied, and hadn't expected nothing else, and the bets being doubled and doubled on the other side all the time, till the money was all up, and then all of a sudden he would grab that other dog just by the joint of his hind leg and freeze to it. Not chew, you understand, but only just grip and hang on till they throwed up the sponge if it was a year. Smiley always come out winner on that pup, till he harnessed a dog once that didn't have no hind legs, cause they'd been sawed off by a circular saw, and when the thing had gone along far enough and the money was all up, and he'd come to make a snatch for his pet holt, he saw in a minute how he'd been imposed on and how the other dog had him in the door, so to speak, and he peered surprised, and then he looked sort of discouraged, like, and didn't try no more to win the fight, and so he got shucked out bad. He give Smiley a look, as much as to say his heart was broke, and it was his fault for putting up a dog that hadn't no hind legs for him to take hold of, which was his main dependence in a fight and then he limped off a piece and laid down and died. It was a good pup, was that Andrew Jackson, and would have made a name for himself if he'd lived, for the stuff was in him, and he had genius. I know it, because he hadn't had no opportunities to speak of, and it don't stand to reason that a dog could make such a fight as he could under them circumstances if he hadn't no talent. It always makes me feel sorry when I think of that last fight of his and, and the way it turned out. Well, this year Smiley had rat tarriers and chicken cocks and tom cats and all them kind of things, till you couldn't rest, and you couldn't fetch nothing for him to bet on, but he'd match you. He catched a frog one day and took him home, and said he calculated to educate him and so he never done nothing for three months but set in his back yard and learn that frog to jump. And you bet he did learn him too. He'd give him a little punch behind, and the next minute you'd see that frog whirling in the air like a doughnut. See him turn one somerset, or maybe a couple if he got a good start, and come down flat-footed and all right like a cat. He got him up so in the matter of catching flies, and kept him in practice so constant that he'd nail a fly every time as far as he could see him. Smiley said all a frog wanted was education, and he could do most anything, and I believe him. I have seen him set Dan'l Webster down here on this floor. Dan'l Webster was the name of the frog, 
and sing out, Flies, Daniel, flies, and quicker than you could wink, he'd spring straight up and snake a fly off on the counter there, and flop down on the floor again as solid as a gob of mud, and fall to scratching the side of his head with his hind foot, as indifferent as if he hadn't no idea he'd been doing any more than any frog might do. You never see a frog so modest and straightforward as he was, for all he was so gifted. And when he come to fair and square jumping on a dead level, he could get over more ground at one straddle than any animal of his breed you ever see. Jumping on a dead level was his strong suit, you understand, and when it come to that, Smiley would ante up money on him as long as he had a red. Smiley was monstrous proud of his frog, and well he might be, for fellows that had travelled and been everywheres all said he laid over any frog that ever they see. Well, Smiley kept the beast in a little lattice box, and he used to fetch him down town sometimes and lay for a bet. One day a fellow, a stranger in the camp he was, come across him with his box and says, What might it be that you've got in the box? And Smiley says, sort of indifferent, like, it might be a parrot, or it might be a canary, maybe, but it ain't, it's only just a frog. And the fella took it and looked at it careful, and turned it round this way and that, and says, Hmm, so tis. Well, what's he good for? Well, Smiley says, easy and careless, he's good enough for one thing. I should judge he can out-jump any frog in Calaveras County. The fellow took the box again, and took another long particular look, and give it back to Smiley, and says, very deliberate, Well, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Maybe you don't, Smiley says. Maybe you understand frog and maybe you don't understand them. Maybe you've had experience, and maybe you are only an amateur, as it were. Anyways, I've got my opinion, and I'll risk forty dollars that he can out-jump any frog in Calaveras County. And the fella studied a minute, and then says, kind of sad, like, well, I'm only a stranger here, and I ain't got no frog. But if I had a frog, I'd bet you. And then Smiley says, That's all right. That's all right. If you'll hold my box a minute, I'll go and get you a frog. And so the fella took the box and put up his forty dollars along with Smiley's and sat down to wait. So he sat there a good while, thinking and thinking to himself, and then he got the frog out and prized his mouth open, and took a teaspoon and filled him full of quail shot, filled him pretty near up to his chin, and set him on the floor. Smiley he went to the swamp and slopped around in the mud for a long time, and finally he catched a frog and fetched him in, and give him to this fellow, and says, now, if you're ready, set him alongside a Daniel, with his four paws just even with Daniel, and I'll give the word. Then he says, one, two, three, jump! And him and the fella touched up the frogs from behind. And the new frog hopped off, but Daniel give a heave, and hoisted up his shoulders, so, like a Frenchman. But it wasn't no use. He couldn't budge. He was planted as solid as an anvil, and he couldn't no more stir than if he was anchored out. Smiley was a good deal surprised, and he was disgusted too, but he didn't have no idea what the matter was, of course. The fellow took the money and started away, and when he was going out at the door, he sort of jerked his thumb over his shoulders this way at Dan'l, and says again, very deliberate, Well, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog. 
Smiley, he stood scratching his head and looking down at Dan'l a long time, and at last he says, I do wonder what in the nation that frog throwed off for. I wonder if there ain't something the matter with him. He appears to look mighty baggy somehow. And he catched Dan'l by the nap of the neck and lifted him up and says, Why, well, blame my cats if he don't weigh five pound. And turned him upside down, and he belched out a double handful of shot. And then he see how it was, and he was the maddest man. He set the frog down and took out after that feller, but he never catched him. And here Simon Wheeler heard his name called from the front yard and got up to see what was wanted. And turning to me as he moved away, he said, Just set where you are, stranger, and rest easy. I ain't going to be gone a second. But by your leave, I did not think that a continuation of the history of the enterprising vagabond Jim Smiley would be likely to afford me much information concerning the Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, and so I started away. At the door I met the sociable Wheeler returning, and he buttonholed me and recommenced. Well, this here Smiley had a yellow one-eyed cow that didn't have no tail, only just a short stump like a banana, and, oh, hang Smiley and his afflicted cow, I muttered good-naturedly, and bidding the old gentleman good day, I departed. Now let the learned look upon this picture and say if iconoclasm can further go. End of chapter Recording by Ruth Golding Sauteuse du comté de Calaveras This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Didier. The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain. Translated by Madame Thérèse Benson. À la requête d'un mien ami qui m'écrivait de l'Est, je rendis visite à Simon Wheeler, vieillard loquace et d'un bon naturel, pour demander des nouvelles d'un ami de mon ami, Leonidas W. Smiley, et j'enregistre ici le résultat de cette démarche. Je soupçonne vaguement Leonidas W. Smiley d'être un mythe. J'imagine que mon ami ne connut jamais le personnage en question, mais qu'il s'était dit que, si j'en parlais au vieux Wheeler, ce serait rappeler à ce dernier son infâme Jim Smiley et que l'ennui presque mortel s'ensuivrait pour moi d'entendre quelque infernale histoire aussi longue, aussi assommante qu'inutile. Si tel fut le projet, il a certainement réussi. Je trouvais Simon Wheeler confortablement assoupi dans la vieille taverne ruinée de l'ancien camp de l'Ange et je remarquais qu'il était gras, chauve, avec une expression toute sympathique de douceur et de simplicité. Il se réveilla et me donna le bonjour. Je lui dis qu'un mien ami m'avait chargé de m'informer auprès de lui d'un compagnon chéri de son enfance, nommé Leonidas W. Smiley, le révérend Leonidas W. Smiley, jeune ministre de l'Évangile, qui avait résidé pour un temps, croyait-il, au camp de l'Ange. J'ajoutai que si M. Wheeler pouvait me donner quelques renseignements à son sujet, je lui serais infiniment obligé. Simon Wheeler me poussa dans un coin, m'y bloqua aussitôt à l'aide de sa chaise, me fit asseoir et dévida le récit monotone qui va suivre. Il ne sourit pas une fois, il ne fronça point le sourcil, jamais il ne changea de ton. Sa voix resta la même depuis la première phrase sans trahir soupçon d'enthousiasme, mais à travers son interminable récit courait une veine de sérieux et de sincérité, preuve évidente que, loin de se figurer qu'il y eût rien de ridicule ou de plaisant dans l'histoire, 
il la considérait comme matière grave et admirait en ces deux héros des hommes d'une transcendante supériorité de finesse. Ainsi que je l'ai dit déjà, je lui demandai ce qu'il savait du révérend Leonidas W. Smiley, et il me répondit comme il suit. Je le laissai filer son nœud à sa guise sans l'interrompre. Il y avait une fois ici un individu connu sous le nom de Jim Smiley. C'était dans l'hiver de quarante-neuf, peut-être bien au printemps de cinquante, je ne me rappelle pas exactement. Ce qui me fait croire que c'était l'un ou l'autre, c'est que je me souviens que le grand bief n'était pas achevé lorsqu'il arriva au camp pour la première fois, mais de toute façon il était l'homme le plus friand de Paris qui pût se voir, pariant sur tout ce qui se présentait, quand il pouvait trouver un adversaire, et quand il n'en trouvait pas, il passait du côté opposé. Tout ce qui convenait à l'autre lui convenait. Pourvu qu'il eût à Paris, Smiley était satisfait. Et il avait une chance, une chance inouïe. Presque toujours il gagnait. Il faut dire qu'il était toujours prêt à s'exposer. On ne pouvait mentionner la moindre chose sans que ce gaillard offrît de parier là-dessus n'importe quoi et de prendre le côté que l'on voudrait, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure. S'il y avait des courses, vous le trouviez riche ou ruiné à la fin. S'il y avait un combat de chien, il apportait son enjeu. Il apportait pour un combat de chat, pour un combat de coq. Parbleu, si vous aviez vu deux oiseaux sur une haie, il vous aurait offert de parier lequel s'envolerait le premier. Et s'il y avait meeting au camp, il venait parier régulièrement pour le curé ou aucun qu'il jugeait être le meilleur prédicateur des environs et qu'il était en effet et un brave homme. Il aurait rencontré une punaise de bois en chemin qu'il aurait parié sur le temps qu'il lui faudrait pour aller où elle voudrait aller et si vous l'aviez prise au mot, il aurait suivi la punaise jusqu'au Mexique sans se soucier d'aller si loin ni du temps qu'il y perdrait. Une fois la femme du curé Walker fut très malade pendant longtemps, il semblait qu'on ne la sauverait pas. Mais un matin, le curé arrive et Smiley lui demande comment elle va. Et il dit qu'elle est bien mieux, grâce à l'infinie miséricorde. Tellement mieux qu'avec la bénédiction de la Providence, elle s'en tirera. Et voilà que sans y penser, Smiley répond, « Eh bien, je gage deux et demi qu'elle mourra tout de même. » Ce Smiley avait une jument que les gars appelaient le bidet du quart d'heure, mais seulement pour plaisanter, vous comprenez, parce que, bien entendu, elle était plus rapide que ça. Et il avait coutume de gagner de l'argent avec cette bête, quoiqu'elle fût poussive, cornade, toujours prise d'asthme, de colique ou de consomption, ou de quelque chose d'approchant. On lui donnait deux ou trois cents yards au départ, puis on la dépassait sans peine, mais jamais à la fin elle ne manquait de s'échauffer, de s'exaspérer, et elle arrivait, s'écartant, se défendant, ses jambes grêles en l'air devant les obstacles, quelquefois les évitant, et faisant avec cela plus de poussière qu'aucun cheval, plus de bruit, surtout avec ses éternuements et reniflements. Crac Elle arrivait donc toujours première d'une tête, aussi juste qu'on peut le mesurer. Et il y avait un petit bulldog qui, à le voir, ne valait pas un sou. On aurait cru que parier contre lui s'était volé, tant il était ordinaire, mais aussitôt les enjeux faits, il devenait un autre chien. Sa mâchoire inférieure commençait à ressortir comme un gaillard d'avant, ses dents se découvraient brillantes comme des fournaises, et un chien pouvait le taquiner, l'exciter, le mordre, le jeter deux ou trois fois par-dessus son épaule. André Jackson, c'était le nom du chien, André Jackson prenait cela tranquillement, comme s'il ne se fût jamais attendu à autre chose, et quand les paris étaient doublés et redoublés contre lui, il vous saisissait l'autre chien juste à l'articulation de la jambe de derrière, et il ne le lâchait plus, non pas qu'il la mâchât, vous concevez, mais il s'y serait tenu pendu jusqu'à ce qu'on jetât l'éponge en l'air, fallut-il attendre un an. 
Smiley gagnait toujours avec cette bête-là. Malheureusement, ils ont fini par dresser un chien qui n'avait pas de pattes de derrière parce qu'on les avait sciés, et quand les choses furent au point qu'il voulait, et qu'il en vint à se jeter sur son morceau favori, le pauvre chien comprit en un instant qu'on s'était moqué de lui et que l'autre le tenait. Vous n'avez jamais vu personne avoir l'air plus penaud et plus découragé. Il ne fit aucun effort pour gagner le combat et fut rudement secoué, de sorte que, regardant Smiley comme pour lui dire « Mon cœur est brisé, c'est ta faute. Pourquoi m'avoir livré à un chien qui n'a pas de pattes de derrière, puisque c'est par là que je les bats ?» Il s'en alla en clopinant et se coucha pour mourir. « Ah, c'était un bon chien, cet André Jackson, et il se serait fait un nom s'il avait vécu, car il y avait de l'étoffe en lui. Il avait du génie, je le sais, bien que de grandes occasions lui aient manqué, mais il est impossible de supposer qu'un chien capable de se battre comme lui, certaines circonstances étant données, ait manqué de talent. Je me sens triste toutes les fois que je pense à son dernier combat et au dénouement qu'il a eu. Eh bien, ce Smiley nourrissait des terriers à rats et des coques de combat et des chats et toutes sortes de choses au point qu'il était toujours en mesure de vous tenir tête et qu'avec sa rage de Paris, on n'avait plus de repos. Il attrapa un jour une grenouille et l'emporta chez lui, disant qu'il prétendait faire son éducation. Vous me croirez si vous voulez, mais pendant trois mois il n'a rien fait que lui apprendre à sauter dans une cour retirée de sa maison. Et je vous réponds qu'il avait réussi. Il lui donnait un petit coup par derrière, et l'instant d'après vous voyiez la grenouille tourner en l'air comme un beignet au-dessus de la poêle, faire une culbute, quelquefois deux, lorsqu'elle était bien partie, et retomber sur ses pattes comme un chat. Il avait dressé dans l'art de gober des mouches, et il y exerçait continuellement, si bien qu'une mouche, du plus loin qu'elle apparaissait, était une mouche perdue. Smiley avait coutume de dire que tout ce qui manquait à une grenouille, c'était l'éducation, qu'avec l'éducation, elle pouvait faire presque tout, et je le crois. Tenez, je l'ai vu poser Daniel Webster là sur le plancher, Daniel Webster était le nom de la grenouille, et lui chanter « Des mouches, Daniel, des mouches !» En un clin d'œil, Daniel avait bondi et saisi une mouche, ici sur le comptoir, puis sauté de nouveau par terre, où il restait vraiment à se gratter la tête avec sa patte de derrière, comme s'il n'avait pas eu la moindre idée de sa supériorité. Jamais vous n'avez vu de grenouille aussi modeste, aussi naturelle, douée comme elle l'était. Et quand il s'agissait de sauter purement et simplement sur terrain plat, elle faisait plus de chemin en un saut qu'aucune bête de son espèce que vous puissiez connaître. Sauter à plat, c'était son fort. Quand il s'agissait de cela, Smiley entassait les jeux sur elle tant qu'il lui restait un rouge liard. Il faut le reconnaître, Smiley était monstrueusement fier de sa grenouille et il en avait le droit, car des gens qui avaient voyagé, qui avaient tout vu, disait qu'on lui ferait injure de la comparer à une autre. De façon que Smiley gardait Daniel dans une petite boîte à Clairvoix qu'il emporta parfois à la ville pour quelques paris. Un jour, un individu étranger au camp l'arrête avec sa boîte et lui dit « Qu'est-ce que vous avez donc serré là-dedans » Smiley dit d'un air indifférent « Cela pourrait être un perroquet ou un serin, mais ce n'est rien de pareil. » Ce n'est qu'une grenouille. L'individu la prend, la regarde avec soin, la tourne à côté et de l'autre, puis il dit « Tiens, en effet, à quoi est-elle bonne ?»« Mon Dieu, » répond Smiley, toujours d'un air dégagé, « elle est bonne pour une chose, à mon avis. Elle peut battre en sautant toute grenouille du comté de Calaveras. » L'individu reprend la boîte, l'examine de nouveau longuement, et la rend à Smiley en disant d'un air délibéré, « Eh bien, je ne vois pas que cette grenouille ait rien de mieux qu'aucune grenouille. »« Possible que vous ne le voyez pas, » dit Smiley, « possible que vous vous entendiez en grenouille, 
possible que vous ne vous y entendiez point, possible que vous ayez de l'expérience et possible que vous ne soyez qu'un amateur. De toute manière, je parie quarante dollars qu'elle battra en sautant n'importe quelle grenouille du comté de Calaveras. L'individu réfléchit une seconde et dit, comme attristé, « Je ne suis qu'un étranger ici, je n'ai pas de grenouille, mais si j'en avais une, je tiendrais le pari. »« Fort bien, » répond Smiley, « rien n'est plus facile. Si vous voulez tenir ma boîte une minute, j'irai vous chercher une grenouille. » Voilà donc l'individu qui garde la boîte, qui met ses quarante dollars sur ceux de Smiley et qui attend. Il attend assez longtemps, réfléchissant tout seul, et figurez-vous qu'il prend Daniel, lui ouvre la bouche de force et avec une cuillère à thé l'emplit de menu plomb de chasse, mais l'emplit jusqu'au menton, puis il le pose par terre. Smiley, pendant ce temps, était à barboter dans une mare. Finalement, il attrape une grenouille, la porte à cet individu et dit « Maintenant, si vous êtes prêts, mettez-la tout contre Daniel avec leurs pattes de devant sur la même ligne et je donnerai le signal. » Puis il ajoute « Un, deux, trois, sautez. » Lui et l'individu touchent leur grenouille par derrière et la grenouille neuve se met à sautiller, mais Daniel se soulève lourdement hausse les épaules ainsi comme un Français. À quoi bon Il ne pouvait bouger, il était planté solide comme une enclume. Il n'avançait pas plus que si on l'eût mis à l'encre. Smiley fut surpris et dégoûté, mais il ne se doutait pas du tour, bien entendu. L'individu empoche l'argent, s'en va, et en s'en allant, est-ce qu'il ne donne pas un coup de pouce par-dessus l'épaule, comme ça au pauvre Daniel, en disant de son air délibéré, « Eh bien, je ne vois pas que cette grenouille est rien de mieux qu'une autre. » Smiley se gratta longtemps la tête, les yeux fixés sur Daniel, jusqu'à ce qu'enfin il dit, « Je me demande comment diable il se fait que cette bête ait refusé. Est-ce qu'elle aurait quelque chose On croirait qu'elle est enflée. » Il empoigne Daniel par la peau du cou, le soulève et dit, « Le loup me croque s'il ne pèse pas cinq livres. » Il le retourne et le malheureux crache deux poignées de plomb. Quand Smiley reconnut ce qui en était, il fut comme fou. Vous le voyez d'ici poser sa grenouille par terre et courir après cet individu, mais il ne le rattrapa jamais. Et, à ce point de son récit, Simon Wheeler entendit son nom crier dans la cour et alla voir ce qu'on lui voulait. Se tournant vers moi, « Restez où vous êtes. »« Étranger, mettez-vous à votre aise, je reviens tout de suite. » Mais avec votre permission, je ne jugeais pas que la suite de l'histoire de ce vagabond entreprenant, Jim Smiley, pût me mettre beaucoup sur la trace du révérend Leonidas W. Smiley, de sorte que je m'en allais de mon côté. À la porte, je rencontrai l'affable Wheeler, qui m'arrêta par la boutonnière et reprit. « Eh bien !» Ce Smiley avait une vache jaune qui était borgne et qui n'avait point de queue, rien qu'un petit tronçon comme une banane, pour ainsi dire. Que le diable emporte Smiley et sa vache affligée, murmurai-je poliment. Et donnant le bonjour au vieux gentleman, je le plantai là. End of La grenouille sauteuse du comté de Calaveras Pumping of the County of Calaveras. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain. Translation of the above back from the French. The Frog Jumping of the County of Calaveras. It there was one time here, an individual known under the name of Jim Smiley. It was in the winter of forty-nine, possibly well at the spring of fifty, I know me recollect not exactly. This which makes me to believe that it was the one or the other, 
it is that I shall remember that the grand flume is not achieved when he arrives at the camp for the first time. But of all sides he was the man the most fond of to bet which one have seen, betting upon all that which is presented when he could find an adversary. And when he not of it could not, he passed to the side opposed. All that which convenienced to the other, to him convenienced also. Seeing that he had a bet, Smiley was satisfied. And he had a chance, a chance even worthless. Nearly always he gained. It must to say that he was always near to himself exposed, but one no could mention the least thing without that this Gaillard offered to bet the bottom, no matter what and to take the side that won him would, as I knew it said all at the hour, tout à l'heure. If it there was of races, you find him rich or ruined at the end. If it there is a combat of dogs, he bring his bet. He himself laid always for a combat of cats, for a combat of cocks, by blue. If you have seen two birds upon a fence, he you should have offered of to bet which of those birds shall fly the first. And if there is meeting at the camp, meeting au con, he comes to bet regularly for the curé walker, which he judged to be the best predicator of the neighbourhood, prédicateur des environs, and which he was, in effect, and a brave man. He would encounter a bug of wood in the road, whom he will bet upon the time which he shall take to go where she would go, and if you him have take at the word, he will follow the bug as far as Mexique, without himself caring to go so far. Neither of the time which he there lost. One time, the woman of the curé walker is very sick during long time. It seemed that one not her saved not. But one morning the curé arrives, and smiley him demanded how she goes and he said that she is well better, grace to the infinite misery, lui demande comment elle va, et il dit qu'elle est bien mieux, grâce à l'infini miséricorde. So much better, that with the benediction of the providence she herself of it would pull out, elle s'en tirerait. And behold that, without their thinking, Smiley responds, Well, I gauge two and a half that she will die all of same. This Smiley had an animal which the boys called the nag of the quarter of hour, but solely for pleasantry, you comprehend, because, well understand, she was more fast as that. Now why that exclamation? M.T. And it was custom of to gain of the silver with this beast, notwithstanding she was poussive, cornard, always taken of asthma, of colics, or of consumption, or something of approaching. One him would give two or three hundred yards at the departure, then one him passed without pain, but never at the last she not fail of herself échauffée, of herself exasperate, and she arrives herself écartant, se défendant, her legs grêle in the air before the obstacles, sometimes them elevating, and making with this more of dust than any horse more of noise above with his étournement and reniflement. Crack! She arrives then always first by one head, as just as one can it measure. And he had a small bulldog. Bulldog! Who, to him see, no value, not a cent. One would believe that to bet against him it was to steal so much he was ordinary. But as soon as the game made, she becomes another dog. Her jaw inferior commenced to project like a deck of before. His teeth themselves discover brilliant like some furnaces. And a dog could him tackle, le taquinet, him excite, him murder, le mordre, him throw two or three times over his shoulder. André Jackson, this was the name of the dog, Andre Jackson takes that tranquilly, as if he not himself was never expecting other thing. And when the bets were doubled and redoubled against him, 
he you seize the other dog just at the articulation of the leg of behind, and he not it leave more, not that he it masticate, you conceive, but he himself there shall be holding, during until that one throws the sponge in the air, must he wait a year. Smiley gained always with this beast la. Unhappily, they have finished by elevating a dog who no had not a feet of behind, because on them had soared. And when things were at the point that he would, and that he came to himself, throw upon his morsel favourite, the poor dog comprehended in an instant that he himself was deceived in him, and that the other dog him had. You know have never see person having the air more penal and more discouraged. He not made no effort to gain the combat, and was rudely shucked. Eh bien, this smiley nourished some terriers are rats, and some cocks of combat, and some cats, and all sorts of things and with his rage of betting one no had more of repose. He trapped one day a frog, and him imported with him, et l'emporta chez lui, saying that he pretended to make his education. You me believe if you will, but during three months he not has nothing done but to him apprehend to jump, apprehend à sauter, in a court retired of her mansion, de sa maison and I you respond that he have succeeded. He him gives a small blow by behind, and the instant after you shall see the frog turn in the air like a grease biscuit, make one somersault, sometimes two, when she was well started, and re-fall upon his feet like a cat. He him had accomplished in the art of to gobble the flies, gobe des mouches, and him there exercised continually so well that a fly at the most far that she appeared was a fly lost. Smiley had custom to say that all which lacked to a frog it was the education, but with the education she could do nearly all, and him I believe. Tenez, I him have seen pose Daniel Webster there upon this plank, Daniel Webster was the name of the frog, and to him sing, Some flies, Daniel, some flies. In a flash of the eye, Daniel had bounded and seized a fly here upon the counter, then jumped anew at the earth, where he rested truly to himself, scratched the head with his behind foot, as if he no had not the least idea of his superiority. Never you not have seen Frog as modest, as natural, sweet as she was. And when he himself agitated to jump purely and simply upon plain earth, she does more ground in one jump than any beast of his species than you can know. To jump plain, this was his strong. When he himself agitated for that, Smiley multiplied the bets upon her, as long as there to him remained a red. It must to know, Smiley was monstrously proud of his frog, and he of it was right, for some men who were travelled, who had all seen, said that they to him would be injurious to him compared to another frog. Smiley guarded Daniel in a little box latticed, which he carried by times to the village for some bet. One day an individual stranger at the camp, him arrested with his box, and him said, What is it that you have then shut up there within? Smiley said, with an air indifferent, That could be a paroquet, or a syringe, ou un serin, but this no is nothing of such, it not is but a frog. The individual it took. It regarded with care. It turned from one side and from the other. Then he said, Tiens, in effect, at what is she good? My God, responds Smiley, always with an air disengaged. 
She is good for one thing, to my notice, à mon avis. She can batter in jumping, elle peut batter en sautant, all the frogs of the county of Calaveras. The individual retook the box. It examined of a new longly, and it rendered to Smiley in saying with an air deliberate, Eh bien! I know saw not that that frog had nothing of better than each frog. Je ne vois pas que cette grenouille ait rien de mieux qu'aucune grenouille. If that isn't grammar gone to seed, then I count myself no judge, M.T. Possible that you not it saw not, said Smiley. Possible that you you comprehend frogs. Possible that you not you there comprehend nothing. Possible that you had of the experience, and possible that you not be but an amateur. Of all manner, de toute manière, I bet forty dollars that she batter in jumping, no matter which frog, of the county of Calaveras. The individual reflected a second, and said, like sad, I not am but a stranger here. I know have not a frog, but if I of it had one, I would embrace the bet. Strong well, respond Smiley, nothing of more facility. If you will hold my box a minute, I go you to search a frog. J'irai vous chercher. Behold, then, the individual who guards the box, who puts his forty dollars upon those of Smiley, and who attends, et qui attend. He attended enough long times, reflecting all solely. And figure you, that he takes Daniel, him opens the mouth by force, and with a teaspoon, him fills with shot of the hunt, even him fills just to the chin, then he him puts by the earth. Smiley, during these times, was at slopping in a swamp. Finally he trapped, attrape, a frog, him carried to that individual, and said, Now, if you be ready, put him all against Daniel, with their before feet upon the same line, and I give the signal. Then he added, One, two, three, advance. Him and the individual touched their frogs by behind, and the frog knew put to jump smartly, but Daniel himself lifted ponderously, exalted the shoulders thus, like a Frenchman. To what good? He could not budge. He is planted solid like a church. He not advance no more than if one him had put at the anchor. Smiley was surprised and disgusted, but he not himself doubted not of the turn being intended. Mais il ne se doutait pas du tour, bien entendu. The individual impocketed the silver, himself with it went, and of it himself in going is that he no gives not a jerk of the thumb over the shoulder, like that, at the poor Daniel, in saying with his air deliberate, L'individu en poche l'argent, s'en va, et en s'en allant, est-ce qu'il ne donne pas un coup de pouce par-dessus l'épaule, comme ça, au pauvre Daniel, en disant de son air délibéré, « Eh bien, I know see not that that frog has nothing of better than another. » Smiley himself scratched long times the head, the eyes fixed upon Daniel, until that which at last he said, I me demand how the devil it makes itself that this beast has refused. Is it that she had something? One would believe that she is stuffed. He grasped Daniel by the skin of the neck, him lifted, and said, The wolf me bite if he no way not five pounds. He him reversed, and the unhappy belched two handfuls of shot et le malheureux, etc. When Smiley recognised how it was, he was like mad. He deposited his frog by the earth, and ran after that individual, but he not him caught never. 
Such is the jumping frog to the distorted French eye. I claim that I never put together such an odious mixture of bad grammar and delirium tremens in my life. And what has a poor foreigner like me done to be abused and misrepresented like this? When I say, well, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog, is it kind? Is it just for this Frenchman to try to make it appear that I said, Eh bien, I know saw not that that frog had nothing of better than each frog. I have no heart to write more. I never felt so about anything before. Hartford, March, 1875 End of the Frog Jumping of the County of Calaveras History of the Jumping Frog Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain Private History of the Jumping Frog Story Five or six years ago, a lady from Finland asked me to tell her a story in our Negro dialect, so that she could get an idea of what that variety of speech was like. I told her one of Hopkinson Smith's Negro stories, and gave her a copy of Harper's Monthly containing it. She translated it for a Swedish newspaper, but by an oversight named me as the author of it instead of Smith. I was very sorry for that because I got a good lashing in the Swedish press, which would have fallen to his share but for that mistake. For it was shown that Boccaccio had told that very story in his curt and meagre fashion, five hundred years before Smith took hold of it and made a good and terrible thing out of it. I have always been sorry for Smith, but my own turn has come now. A few weeks ago Professor Van Dyke of Princeton asked this question. Do you know how old your jumping frog story is? And I answered, Yes, forty-five years. The thing happened in Calaveras County in the spring of 1849. No, it happened earlier, a couple of thousand years earlier. It is a Greek story. I was astonished and hurt. I said, I am willing to be a literary thief, if it has been so ordained. I am even willing to be caught robbing the ancient dead alongside of Hopkinson Smith, for he is my friend and a good fellow, and I think would be as honest as any one if he could do it without occasioning remark. But I am not willing to antedate his crimes by fifteen hundred years. I must ask you to knock off part of that. But the professor was not chaffing. He was in earnest, and could not abate a century. He named the Greek author, and offered to get the book and send it to me, and the college textbook containing the English translation also. I thought I would like the translation best, because Greek makes me tired. January the 30th he sent me the English version, and I will presently insert it in this article. It is my jumping frog tale in every essential. It is not strung out as I would have it strung out, but it is all there. To me this is very curious and interesting, curious for several reasons. For instance, I heard the story told by a man who was not telling it to his hearers as a thing new to them, but as a thing which they had witnessed and would remember. He was a dull person and ignorant. He had no gift as a storyteller and no invention. In his mouth this episode was merely history, history and statistics, and the gravest sort of history, too. He was entirely serious, for he was dealing with what to him were austere facts, and they interested him solely because they were facts. He was drawing on his memory, not his mind. He saw no humour in his tale, neither did his listeners. 
neither he nor they ever smiled or laughed. In my time I have not attended a more solemn conference. To him and to his fellow gold miners there were just two things in the story that were worth considering. One was the smartness of its hero, Jim Smiley, in taking the stranger in with a loaded frog. And the other was Smiley's deep knowledge of a frog's nature, for he knew, as the narrator asserted and the listeners conceded, that a frog likes shot and is always ready to eat it. Those men discussed those two points and those only. They were hearty in their admiration of them, and none of the party was aware that a first-rate story had been told in a first-rate way, and that it was brim-full of a quality whose presence they never suspected, humour. Now, then, the interesting question is, did the frog episode happen in Angel's Camp in the spring of forty-nine, as told in my hearing that day in the fall of 1865? I am perfectly sure that it did. I am also sure that its duplicate happened in Boeotia a couple of thousand years ago. I think it must be a case of history actually repeating itself, and not a case of a good story floating down the ages and surviving because too good to be allowed to perish. I would now like to have the reader examine the Greek story and the story told by the dull and solemn Californian, and observe how exactly alike they are in essentials. Translation The Athenian and the Frog Sidgwick, Greek Prose Composition, page 116 An Athenian once fell in with a Boeotian who was sitting by the roadside looking at a frog. Seeing the other approach, the Boeotian said his was a remarkable frog and asked if he would agree to start a contest of frogs, on condition that he whose frog jumped farthest should receive a large sum of money. The Athenian replied that he would, if the other would fetch him a frog, for the lake was near. To this he agreed, and when he was gone, the Athenian took the frog, and opening its mouth, poured some stones into its stomach, so that it did not indeed seem larger than before, but could not jump. The Boeotian soon returned with the other frog, and the contest began. The second frog first was pinched, and jumped moderately. Then they pinched the Boeotian frog, and he gathered himself for a leap, and used the utmost effort, but he could not move his body the least. So the Athenian departed with the money. When he was gone, the Boeotian, wondering what was the matter with the frog, lifted him up and examined him, and being turned upside down, he opened up his mouth and vomited out the stones. Note, November 1903 When I became convinced that the jumping frog was a Greek story two or three thousand years old, I was sincerely happy, for apparently here was a most striking and satisfactory justification of a favourite theory of mine, to wit, that no occurrence is sole and solitary, but is merely a repetition of a thing which has happened before, and perhaps often. Still, when I later had a chance to see Professor Sidgwick's book, I was a little staggered, because of two things. The details were a little too faithful to the facts in the Calaveras incident for the comfort of my theory, and I could not help being suspicious of the Greek frog, because he was willing to be fed with gravel. One can't beguile the modern frog with that product. By and by, in England, after a few years, I learned that there hadn't been any Greek frog in the business and no Greek story about his adventures. Professor Sidgwick had not claimed that it was a Greek tale. He had merely synopsized the Calaveras tale and transferred the incident to classic Greece. But as he did not state that it was the same old frog, the English papers reproved him for the omission. He told me this in England in 1899 or 1900, and was much troubled about that censure, for his act had been innocent 
he believing that the story's origin was so well known as to render formal mention of it unnecessary. I was very sorry for the censure, but it was not I that applied it. I would not have done it. M.T. End of Private History of the Jumping Frog Story End of The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain